Preface Christianity is simply allowing Christ to live in you, which is what this book is all about. Jesus said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4 verse 4 John 1 verses 1 to 2 says that Jesus Christ is the word that, 1. was with God, 2. was God, and 3. in the beginning with God. This means that, if we are to live by the words of God, we are to live by Jesus Christ himself. This is why Galatians 2 verse 20 tells us that Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God. The way that we do this is by believing God's word to us today, and by using the mind of Christ to allow the Holy Ghost to teach it to us. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 16. The word of God to us today is only found in Paul's epistles, as it is the only part of scripture that was given to Paul for you to fulfill the word of God. Colossians 1 verse 25. These are not Paul's words, but they are the words revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ. Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. Once we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4, we are baptized into Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, Romans 6 verses 3 to 6, such that our lives are hid with Christ in God, making Christ our life, Colossians 3 verses 3 to 4. Thus, those practicing true Christianity are, gospel believers who read and believe God's word, focusing on the doctrine in Paul's epistles, Romans, Philemon, so that Christ lives in them. Such a definition will not be found in any dictionary and is in very few Christian minds. Instead, what most of the Christian religion does is they give of their time and money to a church and seek to follow the laws of that church. Very few of these churchgoers read the Bible on their own. If they do, they rarely believe anything that it says, as they filter their beliefs through the teachings of their particular denomination. The fact that I do not even attend a church makes me an unbeliever in the minds of these people, even though I have trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for my sins, and have the Holy Ghost and the mind of Christ to teach me the things of God as I read the Bible. To avoid confusion in this book, we will refer to the Christian religion as churchianity, which I have defined as, those who claim to be Christians but really believe only what their church or the Christian culture teaches them. These churches base their teachings mostly upon the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and laws found in Matthew through John that are twisted to build up man's pride by shunning God's grace through Christ and lifting up man's accomplishment of these laws through their own efforts, which they attribute to God, in order to make a fair shoe in the flesh. This is what the Bible calls imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. By using churchianity, instead of Christianity, Christ's name avoids blasphemy, as it is not tied to these idolatrous practices. Testimony 1. No Salvation Assurance in Churchianity We've been lied to. It's okay to be angry about it. I am. With things so important as your eternal destiny, your peace of mind, your basic understanding of what God's plan is and where you fit into that plan on the line, it's imperative that we get to the truth. The truth will make us free, John 8 verse 32. I grew up going to a Baptist church. It wasn't something terribly important to me, it's just what we did. I believed in God and knew that the most important thing in life was to know where you were going to spend eternity. I trusted Christ when I was a boy and was happy in my knowledge that I was going to go to heaven when I died. This was just based on what I was told. I remember being surprised when others didn't want to learn about getting to heaven. I went to a public school and quickly learned that the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't something you spoke about. Around junior high age, I started going to these church camps that our church would offer for the youth. They promised to be a great time up in the mountains. Spiritually speaking, these camps were not good for me. I ended up learning to equate emotionalism with spiritual health. After all, these speakers were the authority on spiritual matters. This all got me thinking, what was I basing my assurance of salvation on? If I was honest with myself, I hadn't turned my life over to God, whatever that means, and what exactly was the standard as far as making Christ Lord of your life? What if I only made him Lord over 95%? Was that enough? What if I was only 97% sincere? Was that enough? How was I to measure it? 
Was one moment of sincerity enough to cover me for the rest of my life? How do I know if I'm accepting him into my heart and not just my mind? Nothing was tangible. How could I ever rest without knowing for sure if I was saved and if I could stay saved? The stakes were so high. I'd heard hell described and I wanted no part. I remember trying so hard to align my heart and mind and motives and sincerity and words in one perfect moment where I'd know that I did everything just right so that God would save me. After all, I should feel saved if I truly was. I should break down an emotion if it was real, right? These spiritual authorities taught me that my performance had something to do with getting and staying saved. They lied to me. The result was that I was secretly miserable and thinking there was something terribly wrong with me that. I had these doubts and questions. They seemed so sure. Why did it come so easy for them? When you combine these immeasurable questions with Bible passages that speak of having to endure until the end, Matthew 24 verse 13, and falling away to damnation, Mark 3 verse 29, Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6, and if you sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no more sacrifice for sins, Hebrews 10 verses 26 to 31, you get confusion and misery. I wouldn't get those questions answered for many years. Consequently, I wouldn't be able to abandon my spiritual misery for many years. So I got in the world. That solved absolutely nothing. Enter more misery. Along the way through life, I did visit different kinds of churches. I went to a Calvary Chapel, a megachurch, and I even tried a Pentecostal church. I never got settled. I never got my questions answered. The truth was, I didn't believe I ever could or would get them answered. After all, Mormons and Muslims, and everybody in between, say they know and feel God. Was there an objective way to know? Was there an unchanging final authority that could tell me? I thought, no, there wasn't. That's why I studied psychology in college. I was trying to understand what was wrong with me, and how to fix it. Come to find out, there is as much uncertainty in psychology as there is in Christianity. Mind you, I wasn't a terribly bad person according to human standards. But I felt lost. So at times I took on the philosophy that I should eat and drink, for tomorrow, one, die, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 32. I was always one to go all in in whatever I was into at the time. That can be a good or a very bad thing. Fast forward to my 28th year of life. Through a very strange set of circumstances I came to hear the message that changed everything. I heard a message that told me that there was an objective final authority that would always be right, that I could understand it and that the apparent contradictions weren't contradictions at all, that I could find rest. The truth is, I found the truth. Testimony 2. The Confessions of a Recovering Christian Lawaholic. church camp. That's 18 and counting. My record is 22. I said to the volunteer camp worker, see if you can break the record. He said, as a way of trying to cheer me up. I was 10 years old and at church camp for the first time. It was a week-long camp and I was on day three. I had been dropped off in the mountains for a week of fun with other church kids my own age. Only church events were considered safe activities for me and so I should have no problem here. But, I was having a problem, a big problem. I just vomited 18 times since I had arrived and was in danger of breaking my own record. I first arrived at camp on a late Sunday afternoon after church. My church only had about 30 people in it, which meant I was one of only three kids from my church there. When we were dropped off, I started playing catch with one of these kids and was having a good time. Then, we were all called to one place to have dinner. I do not know how many kids were there, maybe 200. While my church was small, there were many other churches of my denomination in the area. Plus, there may have been kids there from other churches, I don't know. Regardless, the only kids I knew were the two from my church, since this was my first time ever attending church camp. I never wanted to go before because the kids at school always picked on me for being such a good boy, but my mom said this would be different. It would be fun because all of the kids were like me, i.e., good Christians. So, I agreed to go. Shortly after dinner, I started getting sick. I told the adults in charge, and they asked if I had been to camp before. No. 
I said, have you spent the night away from your family before? I have, but only one time. I said, oh, then you're just homesick. You'll start to feel better tomorrow. They said, so, off I went to my assigned cabin for the night. I believed them. I always believed everything adults told me. Why? Because my mom never lied to me, and I mean never. No little white lies, no pretending there is a Santa Claus or a tooth fairy no lies. She also never said anything sarcastically, and she never was joking. So, when I asked her a question, she always gave me an honest answer. I naturally assumed that all adults behaved in this manner. So, if someone told me something, I believed it, end of story. For example, as a young, child, I asked my dad how to say the days of the week in Chinese, he said, Sunda, Manda, Chikalaka Funda, Hoi Hoi Hunga, Hai. He only said that to me once about 35 years ago, and I still remember exactly what he said. Why? Because I committed it to permanent memory through spending a great deal of time over the next few weeks analyzing what he said, trying to figure out what each day of the week was. I figured Sunda and Manda were Sunday and Monday and that Saturday was high, but I couldn't figure out how to break up the rest of the syllables into Tuesday through Friday. Why did I do this? Because I thought he was telling me the truth. All you readers out there probably think I was stupid for thinking so, but when most of my adult interactions were with my mom and she always told me the truth, I assumed everyone else did the same no matter how bizarre that truth sounded. This truth-telling assumption continued for me until I became an adult. For example, when I was in my late teens, the going rate for a gym membership was about $15 per month. I once called Gold's Gym and asked them how much their membership was. The man said, $200 per month. I said, okay, thanks. Just before I hung up the phone, he said, wait a minute. I was only kidding. How could you not know that? I don't know, I said. The truth was that I did not know he was kidding because my mom never kidded with me. She was always serious, always told me the truth, and so I believed everything that adults told me. Therefore, when the adults at the camp said that I was homesick, I was 100% confident that that was why I was sick. I did not think they were guessing. I accepted what they said as fact. However, in hindsight, I now know that was not the case. The truth was that I was scared, and, as time went on, it only got worse. There are a few reasons why I was scared. First, I had been separated from the other two kids from my church they were assigned to different cabins. Plus, they did not want to hang around with me anyway, because I did not know how to have any fun. Therefore, everyone around me was a stranger. Second, contrary to what my mom said, the other kids were not like me at all. I hated going to school because of how mean the kids were to me there, and these kids were even worse then. The Kids at School I attended a Pentecostal holiness church, which taught me that, if I committed just one sin, I would lose my salvation and have to get saved again. My family went by the old rules of the church the ones that were in place when my grandma joined the church in 1928. And, I probably followed those rules better than any other kid alive. When you are a 10-year-old kid at church camp, following the rules is not a good thing, and following 60-year-old rules is even worse. When I went to the dinner, I found out the kids there were not interested in following any rules, regardless of when they were created. They were now outside of parental supervision, which meant they could go hog wild. They were normal kids who did whatever they could get away with. I was an abnormal kid who lived entirely by my conscience as much as possible, and I had more rules stored in my conscience than anyone else there did, including the adults. I started hearing the kids talking about how fun it is to raid the other cabins and how they brought supplies for such an occasion. In other words, these kids went to this camp every year and it was their best opportunity to break the rules. They were not going to let this opportunity go to waste. They talked about sneaking out in the middle of the night, going to the other cabins, and filling kids' sleeping bags with shaving cream, toothpaste, and other items they had brought for raiding purposes. 
I knew such things were sinful and would cause me to lose my salvation. Therefore, I would have no part in them. I was afraid of telling them this because I knew they would just pick on me like kids at school always did. I knew the routine by now. Therefore, I kept quiet about it and prayed that I would not be expected to get involved. If I was asked, I would have to tell them that going raiding would be against the camp rules, which would be a sin that I could burn in hell for, which is why I could not go. Why not make up some excuse so that they would not pick on me? You ask. Because that would be lying, which would also cause me to burn in hell. Therefore, not only was I afraid of going raiding, but I was also afraid of being asked to go raiding. As much as I was bothered by the idea of raiding, something else bothered me even more. At dinner, some of the kids told me that there would be a dance at the end of camp. The 1928 rules of the church prohibited dancing, which meant that, in my mind, I would lose my salvation if I even attended this dance, and there certainly was no way I would actually dance. There. A couple of years later, I would be the only child at my Baptist-run school who would not sign a request by the students to hold a dance there, which brought persecution from my peers. It is a difficult life being a goody two-shoes. This scared me even more because there was no way I could get around it. In the case of the raiding, I could stay behind and tell the camp counselor. He would then try to put a stop to it. Granted, I would be ridiculed and picked on for the rest of camp, but at least my salvation would be intact. However, the dance was something I could not get out of. Since the Bible says I am to submit to those who have the rule over me, Hebrews 13 verse 17, I would lose my salvation if I did not go to the dance. I would also lose my salvation if I did go to the dance. Therefore, I had to find a way out of that dance. My mom, in her naivety, thought I would have fun when I had actually been placed into the den of hell in my mind with no escape. So, basically, at the dinner, I learned that this fun week at camp was really the church leading all of its kids into the pit of hell. I felt trapped, like there was no way out for me. Therefore, I wasn't really homesick, but I was sick over thinking that it would be impossible to keep my salvation during this church camp. Since the counselors thought I would be better in the morning, I went to my assigned cabin. Things only got worse there. At dinner, we were in mixed company. Now that I was in the cabin, I was surrounded by other 10-year-old boys with one adult supervisor, who, since he was a volunteer, was not exactly gung-ho about keeping order. The kids were making fun of my Winnie the Pooh sleeping bag. I was scared into thinking that we could be raided or we would go raiding at any moment, and I was humiliated by having to take a shower at the same time in front of other boys since it was a common shower area. I never took showers at home. I only took baths. So, I did not even know how they were operated, and the other boys were more interested in laughing at me than helping out. I also had never stood naked among other boys before in my entire life. The whole experience was very frightening to me. So frightening, in fact, that I do not remember much about that night. I just remember not sleeping at all, because I was terrified that another boy would sneak up and fill my sleeping bag with shaving cream. I also was terrified of the other boys trying to get me to sneak out with them to go raiding. If I went and did not do anything, I would still lose my salvation, because I disobeyed. Someone in authority over me. If I did not go, I would be ridiculed, made fun of, and picked on even more so for the rest of the week. I was sure to have my sleeping bag filled with shaving cream and toothpaste then, and I would have to try to explain to my mom what happened which I dreaded having to do, because I was afraid that she would blame me for it. I don't remember if I survived the night in that cabin or not. However, I do know that, by the next day, I had convinced the camp counselor that I was too sick to stay in camp with the rest of the kids. By the way, the church also had camp at a separate time for the men. This was not any better, because the pastors there spent most of the time making the men feel guilty about how they treated their wives, which resulted in the women getting expensive gifts afterward that the men could not afford to buy and they stressed out over how they would pay for them. I imagine many people in the church went bankrupt because they lived by faith. Now, I spent all of my time in the main building with an adult or two. Mostly, I was lying down in bed all day because I was vomiting so much. But, at least I did not have to worry about raiding. 
However, the adults really wanted me to get better so that I could have fun at camp with the other kids and I would be out of their hair. So, while lying in bed, I was afraid that, eventually, I would get better and have to spend my nights in that cabin with the other kids, which was, in my mind, the scariest place I had ever been to in my life. Also, remember that I was 10 years old and knew no one in the cabin. Then, there was the matter of that dance that I would be forced to attend at the end of the week. I kept thinking about these things, I can have laser sharp focus on one or two things at a time, as seen by my memorization of my dad's Chinese days of the week. The result was that I just got more and more nervous and more and more sick. I kept vomiting over and over again. I wanted to go home, not because I was homesick, but because I was in the pit of hell in that camp. The counselors did not have a clue about this and thought I would get over my homesickness soon and have fun the rest of the week. If they only knew that the most fun I could possibly have at the camp was to vomit constantly in the safe environment of the adults. The camp full of kids felt like some cruel and unusual punishment to me. I never wanted to return to that. So, I kept begging to go home. The problem was that my mom was working and my grandpa did not feel comfortable driving up the curvy mountain road to pick me up. So, I stayed there. Eventually, on day three of the camp, my pastor and his wife drove up the mountain and took me home. I had never been so relieved in all of my life. I don't remember if I set a new vomiting record during those three days or not, but I do know that I did get up to 20. No matter, because I set a new record of 24 vomits in a sickness a couple of years later. Yes, it was a proud moment. So, why was I not able to live in my world without getting sick all of the time? The answer to that is my beliefs. My background. My parents separated when I was two years old. My mom took me to live with her parents, and we started attending the church of her youth, which was a Pentecostal holiness church. Pentecostal means that they spoke in tongues, moved in the Holy Ghost, and anointed people with oil and prayed over them believing in divine healing of physical ailments. Holiness means that they taught that you must live a perfect, holy life in order to enter heaven. I was constantly reminded that sin can never enter there. We attended every time the doors were open, which was Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, an occasional home service, two weeks of revivals each year with service every night, and all-day services for two days at the annual state convention. I cannot remember a time when I was not attending services at that church during my childhood. One teaching of the church consumed my thought life and was a big part of my conscience. That teaching was that, while you are saved by Jesus' death on the cross, you keep your salvation by living a holy life, which means that you must live perfectly. If you commit just one little sin, you lose your salvation, and you must ask God to forgive you in order to regain your salvation. Living a sinless life may seem like an impossible task, but the church assured me that it was not. There were several people in the church who would claim that they had not sinned in many years. Never mind that scripture says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1 verse 8. The reason they could go for years without sinning is because the church said that there are three definitive works of grace in the believer's life, 1. Salvation, 2. Sanctification, and 3. Filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Salvation is believing in Jesus' death as atonement for your sin. As the church defined it, sanctification is the eradication of the Adamic sin nature. In the church's view, if you are sanctified, you will never sin again, because you cannot sin, since the sin nature is gone. This was a literal application of 1 John 3 verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is the power for service. You will never serve God in your full capacity without being filled with the Holy Ghost. The church would say that, when you are saved, you receive God's Spirit, but you do not receive the Holy Ghost until you speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is the evidence that the Holy Ghost is now in you. Although it was a small church, numbers were a very big deal to my church. Each business meeting would have the whole church in attendance where all the numbers were told. 
The most important numbers of all were given at the annual state convention, where each pastor and evangelist would report to the thousand or so people in attendance how many people had been saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost during the services they conducted in the last year. Usually, all three numbers would be the same. For example, Brother Davis, all believers were called brother or sister, might report that there were five people saved, five people sanctified, and five people filled with the Holy Ghost in his services. This meant that five people received all three definitive works of grace during the year. Now, because the church was Pentecostal, speaking in tongues and moving in the Holy Ghost were the primary reason that a lot of people attended services. For an evening service, the pastor would finish preaching and then invite everyone to come to the altar and pray. All of the regulars, including myself, went to the front, knelt at the altar, and prayed. Usually, there would be a handful of people who would speak in tongues, and two or three would speak in tongues for a long time. It was usually the same people each time. Prayer time would usually begin about 90 minutes into the service, and tongue talking would go on for at least 30 more minutes, but usually more like 60 to 90 minutes. Therefore, if a service started at 7 p.m., it was over no earlier than 9 p.m., but it could go on until 10 or 11 p.m., depending on how the spirit moved. Now, I should say that it was extremely rare that an interpretation of the tongue talking was given. Typically, you would hear someone speaking in tongues aloud with a few people around her praying, and the people around her would also speak in tongues on occasion. Thus, they tongue talked over each other. While my grandmother, grandfather, mom, uncle, and myself attended services, my grandmother was the only one who was into the tongue talking. My grandfather, mom, and uncle all claimed to be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, but I never actually heard any of them speak in tongues. Personally, I think they just said that so that no one would bother them. After all, if you have all three, you will never sin again and you have the power for service with the Holy Ghost. So, there is nothing left for you to pray to get, which means no one will try to get you to pray for those things, since they cannot add you to their numbers for the business meeting. Because my mom was not into tongue talking, she never tried to push me into it. She believed that, if God wanted to give me the Holy Ghost, He would. If not, He would not. Still, my whole upbringing had taught me that speaking in tongues was the most important thing you could ever do in this life. Therefore, it was something I desired. At the same time, it really scared me that I would lose control of my tongue, and God would magically speak through me. So, I never pursued it. I figured that, if I was holy enough, the Lord would cause it to happen. That was another thing about the church. They put a lot of guilt on you. If you did not speak in tongues, then you must have an unconfessed sin on your life that is keeping you from being a holy vessel for the Holy Ghost. Still, I had never heard my mom speak in tongues, and she was perfect as. Far as I could tell, so, it was not a big deal, except to add a little guilt to my conscience, as if I did not have enough guilt already, wondering why I never spoke in tongues. When it was time to pray after the sermon was over, I did the same thing every time. I would go to the altar, everyone went to the altar if they were physically able to do so, and pray for a few minutes, and then go back to my seat. I prayed for about two to three minutes at every altar call. I was always the first one back in my seat. I wanted to pray longer so that I would not be the first one done, but I really did not know of anything else to tell God, so, I would quit and go back to my seat. My mom would do the same thing, except she prayed a little longer than I did. Then, we both sat there and waited for the service to end. If someone started feeling the Spirit while praying, we would know it because a few people would gather around her, women were the primary tongue talkers in the church, and start praying along with her. Everyone prayed aloud in this church at all times, except for my mom and me. So, if several people were praying, you could not understand what they were saying, because they were all talking over each other. If a few people started praying over someone, this would be our K to start praying silently in our pew while that person was praying. If we were down to one tongue talker praying, I would secretly pray that the person would stop the tongue talking soon because, the longer the person prayed, the greater the chance that someone else praying would also start talking in tongues. Then, I would have to wait for that person to finish before the service was over. 
Alas, God often did not answer my prayer. So, my mom and I sat in our seats, silently praying for the tongue talkers, for about 60 to 90 minutes twice per week. Tongue talking usually did not delay the end of the Sunday morning service, except on rare occasions. I guess the spirit doesn't move well when people have lunch plans. My view of sin. Before I get into my view of sin, keep in mind that I believed everything I was told, because my family was always truthful with me. For example, one time my Baptist-run school took the class on a field trip, because I was so worried over sinning, and or being picked on by the other kids, I got sick and vomited at least once per week during those years. Since I was going to be on a field trip, which meant I could not lie down at school should I get sick, my mom gave me Pepto-Bismol tablets to take with me. On the car ride back to school, one of the kids told me to give him a tablet so that he could fart and really stink up the car. I told him that the tablets were only for sick people. He then said, I feel sick, so, I gave him a tablet and he farted up the car. It never even occurred to me that he could be lying about being sick. Since I believed a snot-nosed kid was telling the truth, I certainly believed everything that the church told me, since they spoke for God. Now, I do not remember the exact time when I asked for forgiveness of sins for the first time. I was probably about five years old. My family said that was the greatest decision I would ever make, because I would now go to heaven. However, that is when I started feeling bad, because, from then on, I had to live perfectly, or else I would lose my salvation. Compounding the problem was that my view of sin was the Bible's presentation of it, rather than most people's view of sin. Most people think of sin as breaking one of the Ten Commandments, or doing one of the deadly sins, whatever those are. However, the Bible says that sin is in the heart, and not in your actions. Jesus said, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Matthew 5 verses 27 to 28. Jesus also said, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within, and defile the man, Mark 7 verses 21 to 23. From these two passages, I knew that sin is not me telling a lie, but I had already sinned in my heart when I had the mere thought of telling a lie. While the people in the church, for the most part, were concerned with not letting people see them sin so that they could appear to be perfect to the rest of the church, I was concerned with not actually sinning so that I would actually be perfect so that I could actually go to heaven. In other words, I was concerned with what God thought of me, since He is the only one who will decide if I go to heaven or hell. Since God says that the sin comes from within, I knew that, if I even thought about telling a lie, I needed to quickly ask God for forgiveness, or else I would go to hell if I died before doing so. You may think there is no harm in telling a little, white lie. However, I knew my Bible very well, because I read it often, especially the legalistic parts that had been hammered into my brain. I knew that, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6 verse 23, and that whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all, James 2 verse 10. Therefore, as far as God is concerned, if I even thought about telling a lie, it was just as bad as being a serial killer. Therefore, I was constantly asking God for forgiveness, so that I could maintain my salvation. But, my sin slash guilt problem goes even deeper than what you probably think. Not only did I know that I sinned when I thought about doing something wrong, but I also had a much longer list of wrongs built in my conscience than most people have. That is because the church added their own sins to what the Bible defined as sin. The church had teachings that they adhered to that were more important to the church than the Bible itself. In my mind, if I disobeyed any of these teachings, I had sinned. These teachings said, among other things, that it was a sin to, one, wear any kind of jewelry or makeup, two, not tithe, three, drink any alcohol, four, smoke a cigarette, five, join a lodge, or six, curse. In addition to these teachings, the church also had a separate list of advice that was even stricter. Things included in this separate list as sin were, one, going to a movie theater, 2. Participating in co-ed swimming, and 3. Going to a bowling alley. 
Therefore, I was trying to obey the Bible's teachings and also the church's teachings and advice. The list of possible sins seemed endless. For example, one time I received a green plastic ring as a prize in a Cracker Jack box. Romans 3 verse 20 says that by the law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 7 verse 13 says that our sin nature works with our conscience to cause us to disobey our conscience. Since my conscience told me it was a sin to wear that plastic ring, my sin nature tried to get me to wear that plastic ring. So, I got away by myself and tried the ring on. Then, I was overwhelmed with guilt. So, I took it off, threw it away, and begged God to forgive me. Without the church's teaching against wearing jewelry, this never would have happened. Therefore, not only was I always feeling guilty for not being perfect, but I also had more rules to be not perfect and than most everyone else did. How many kids, other than myself, were genuinely afraid that they would go to hell for wearing a plastic ring for a few seconds? Therefore, I was under a great deal of stress just attending a Baptist-run school. I hated field trips because I would always get sick due to some temptation that I would be forced into. For example, on the aforementioned field trip, I got sick because the place we went to had a little recording studio where several kids could sing a popular song and then hear it played afterward for everyone else to listen to. Because I was a good singer of the hymns in school, a few kids convinced me to go into the studio with them, which I thought would be fun, too. I assumed we would be singing a good song like The Old Rugged Cross, Amazing Grace, or Joy Unspeakable. Then, I found out the song was the most popular song of the day, Dash Beat It by Michael Jackson. My church viewed all secular music as being of the devil, and so I had never heard the song, or any other secular song, for that matter, save a few Christmas songs, like Jingle Bells. I stayed in the back, playing a drum, while the other kids sang. While they were having fun, I was stressed out that I had lost my salvation by participating in such a vile activity, which made me sick the rest of the day. Therefore, while most kids looked forward to field trips, I dreaded them because there would probably be more opportunities to sin there and to be picked on by the other kids. Not only was I worried about my sin, but I was also worried about other people sinning. When my dad remarried, he wore a wedding ring. I tried several times to take the ring off of his finger because I was afraid he would go to hell for wearing it. He also drank the occasional beer and I honestly thought he would go to hell and would probably die within a few years from alcohol poisoning, even though I never saw him drunk. Suffice it to say, my relationship with my dad was not that good. My third grade teacher, at the Baptist-run school that I went to, wore fingernail polish sometimes. It would be hard for me to concentrate on what she was trying to teach me, because I would get nervous looking at her, thinking that she could die. at school and go to hell for wearing makeup. I went to a vacation Bible school at a Baptist church for one week when I was about eight years old. The pastor spoke to us for a little while every day. That was over 30 years ago, so I have no idea what he said, but I still vividly remember staring at the multicolored ring he wore and wondering how in the world he could be the pastor of the church since he was obviously backslidden and bound for hell due to that ring he wore. Even to this day, I cringe whenever I hear a four-letter word uttered, and not just the major curse words, but the minor ones, as well. Therefore, the battle between the sin nature and the conscience within my mind has always been greater than anyone could imagine, unless you grew up in a similar circumstance, which very few have, I suppose. Traumatic Experiences You probably already feel sorry for me for the internal suffering I went through over such trivial things. But, I have only begun to tell you my story. The following experience was the worst of all. It caused me many sleepless nights and many sick days over the next 10 years or so. When I was around 8 years old, I played Little League Baseball during the summer. I would walk to the local school whenever we had a practice or a game. If we had a game that was not at the local school, a bunch of us would pile into the back of the coach's car and ride to the other park, which was never a long distance away. This was before the seatbelt law, so, we would literally be jammed into the back of her car. Now, when I say coach, think babysitter, because that is what she was. She was probably about 17 years old, working part-time for the city's parks and recreation department. One day, I got into her back seat like normal, 
and I was surprised that it wasn't crowded like normal. The reason was because she told everyone, except me and another boy, that they would have to ride with one of the parents that day. I did not associate with the other boys that much, because I was afraid they would try to get me to sin. So, I rarely had friends in school or talked to anyone unless I had to. Therefore, I did not know that I could not ride with her that day. Because she failed to tell me and the other boy about getting another ride, we were the only two allowed to ride with her. The reason she did not want boys riding with her that day was because she had three of her male friends, probably around 18 or 19 years old, riding with her. That car ride to the other park would prove to be the most traumatic 15 minutes of my life. Those men were cussing up a storm. F this, and F that was all I heard from them. I do not recall ever hearing anyone use the F word before that time, since we never went to the movies and we only had network television at home. The only time I had even heard the word was when it was etched into a student desk seat. I said it aloud at age four, not knowing what it meant, and my mom scolded me, telling me never to say that word again. Therefore, the only time I had heard the word was when it came out of my own mouth. Now, I was hearing constant cursing for about 15 minutes. This was such a traumatic experience for me that I just could not get it out of my head. For years, I could hear their voices, spewing forth all of those curse words. Remember that the Bible says that the sin nature works with the law to cause you to sin. Therefore, when I went to bed at night, I heard those curse words in my head. Since I knew that sin comes from my thoughts, hearing those words internally was just as much of a sin to me as if I was shouting them out at the top of my lungs. Therefore, I would quickly ask God to forgive me of my sin, and I would tell myself not to think of those curse words. However, the more I told myself not to think of those words, the more I thought of them, causing me to sin and ask God to forgive me of my sin again. This would happen several times each night for several years before I went to sleep. Therefore, I had asked God to forgive me and resave me thousands of times before I was an adult. But, it gets worse from here. Not too long after this, the church had someone make a presentation on demon possession and satanic influence on music. This presentation included graphic pictures and the playing of music backwards, black masking, to reveal hidden satanic messages, such as, Satan, he is God. The speaker warned us that we have to be very careful, because we could easily be possessed by demons by listening to this music. If that were the case, why did he play it for us in church? Before, I had trouble going to sleep because I had to get resaved several times every night and keep thinking of what I am not supposed to think about so that I do not sin and have to get resaved again. Now, I have something else to worry about, which is being possessed by a demon. So, now, I was asking God to forgive me of my sin. and resave me, and, if I were to sin again, for him, to keep a demon from possessing me. Because the church taught that Satan, demonic activity, and sin are attached to the dark, I began sleeping, or should I say, not sleeping, at night with either my bedroom television on, the light in the hallway on, or both, my bedroom door was open so that I could see the light. I still vividly remember staring at that hallway light with the orange, plastic cover on it, thinking that, by doing so, I could somehow spot a demon if he were to come in so that I could quickly ask God for forgiveness so that the demon would not possess my body. After all, a boy bound for hell is certainly susceptible to demonic possession. Therefore, being in darkness now scared me because I thought a demon would possess me. Being sanctified makes things worse. And, it gets worse from here. Remember back to the three, definitive works of grace that the church taught could take place in a person's life. Remember also how pastors like to have numbers to report at the state convention. Well, bro, Davis preached a revival at our church. At the end of the service, I went through my usual routine of going to the altar, praying for two or three minutes, and then sitting back down. Since I was the first one to get through, bro, Davis came over to me. He asked me if I was saved, and I said that I was. He asked if I was sanctified, and I said that I was not. Then, he explained what sanctification is and asked if I would like to go back to the altar to ask God to sanctify me. While I was scared of tongue-talking, I was not scared of sanctification. 
After all, I was struggling so much with sin, it would be great to have the Adamic nature eradicated so that I would not have those bad thoughts anymore. So, I went to the altar. Bro Davis went with me and started praying over me. He did not tell me what to pray or how I would know I was sanctified. All I knew was that I was supposed to be praying for God to sanctify me. I did not know what to say. I was too shy to pray aloud, so I kept praying over and over within my heart, Lord, sanctify me. Lord, sanctify me. Lord, sanctify me. I kept saying those words over and over to myself, hundreds of times. After a while, other people were at the altar with their hands laid on me, praying aloud. My mom was even up there praying. I could actually hear her, which shocked me because I had never heard my mom pray aloud before. She was a Bible believer like me. Therefore, she tried to follow Matthew 6 verse 6 which says, Pray to thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But, I guess she was just too excited to follow that verse that day. Meanwhile, I did not know what to pray or how I would know that God had sanctified me. I had never asked anyone about it, and no one had ever told me. However, everyone who was sanctified was absolutely sure about it. So I figured that somehow God would make it clear to me that he had sanctified me. So, I kept praying, Lord, sanctify me. Lord, sanctify me. I had no idea how long I had been praying. It turns out that I had been repeating that phrase in prayer over and over for about an hour. But I did know that I was the only one kneeling at the altar and that the whole church was praying for me. I had become the person who was making everyone stay late, which is what I did not like other people doing to me. I kept waiting for something to happen, but nothing ever did. I began thinking that I was now in a bind. I did not feel any different, but I did not think praying any longer would help matters. I also did not want to disappoint all the people around me, especially my mom, who I had just heard pray aloud for the first time. I knew I was supposed to tell the truth, but I could not just get up after an hour and tell everyone that nothing happened. So, I calmly got up and, through tear-filled eyes, pronounced that God had sanctified me. Now, Bro Davis could add me to his state convention report, and everyone in the church, except for me, was happy about it. At the next service, I heard my Sunday school teacher tell my mom that I had always been a good boy, but now I would be even better. That statement absolutely crushed me. I had been the best boy I could possibly be before, and yet I was having to get resaved multiple times every single night, and I could not sleep because I was afraid a demon would possess me. The latter was a much worse fear to me than the former, because, since I was young, I thought dying in my sleep was highly unlikely, but I could always unconsciously go to sleep with an unconfessed sin on my life and wake up the next day as a demon-possessed boy. The church also talked about sins of omission, where you can sin by failing to do something. You were supposed to do. I was not sure what those were, but I was pretty sure that I was probably committing those, too, which means that I could go to hell and not even know why. At the same time, I now had to be an even better behaved boy than I already was so that no one would really know that I was really was not sanctified. Therefore, I had to keep from committing any sin, because, if I did sin, everyone would know that I was not sanctified, since sanctified people cannot sin, since they no longer have the Adamic nature. Therefore, I now had an incredible amount of pressure on me at night to stay saved and keep a demon from possessing me while I slept, and during the day to keep people thinking that I was really sanctified when I knew that I was not, because I did not feel sanctified because I still had bad thoughts. Therefore, those F words haunted my thought process both day and night now, because I thought even more of how I needed to keep from thinking about them. Remember that I went to a Baptist-run school. Because I was trying so hard to maintain my salvation, I always did what the teacher wanted me to do, which made me the teacher's pet. The result was that I was constantly picked on by all of the boys, who would hit me and talk mean to me. Even some of the girls did the same thing. To give you an example, in the last quarter of fifth grade, the teacher brought out advanced reading books with the idea that they would help us improve our reading. Everyone, including myself, hated those books. The teacher kept the books locked in his filing cabinet in the classroom and would bring them out in the afternoon each day for us to read. One day, the teacher had to step out of the classroom and left us alone for 10 to 15 minutes. 
When he did, one of the boys said he could pick the lock of the filing cabinet with a paper clip. He was successful. The boys quickly took the reading books out of the filing cabinet and hid them. Later in the day, when the teacher discovered that the reading books were not in there anymore, he looked right at me and asked where the other kids had hidden the reading books. Since I did not want to go to hell, I told him where the books were and what the other kids had done. So, they got in trouble, while I did not. Of course, this meant that the kids would pick on me even more. On many mornings, I could not open my locker to get my books out until all the boys had went back inside, because they would mess up my combination so that I would have. To start all over again. Now, the teacher did intervene on my behalf occasionally, but he really wanted me to learn how to fight my own battles. However, I would not fight back, because Jesus said, resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, Matthew 5 verse 39. Therefore, if I fought back, I would be sinning and would go to hell if I died right then. So, I would not fight back. Suffice it to say that I hated being at school, because the kids made fun of me and picked on me the whole time for being teacher's pet. Meanwhile, I did not have any rest at night, because I was afraid of losing my salvation and going to hell by thinking of a four-letter word and dying in my sleep. Even if I did not die, I was afraid that a devil would possess me while I was asleep, because I had an unconfessed sin on my life. On top of this, I had faked being sanctified, which meant that I still had the Adamic nature and still sinned, but I had to put on an act to everyone that I would never sin again, because the church folks thought I would be perfect, because I told them I was sanctified. Therefore, I was always worried about sinning and about the boys at school mistreating me. The result was that I got sick at least once per week with vomiting several times. I was so skinny and so sick that my mom spent a great deal of money, taking me to all kinds of doctors over a period of several years. I had every exam possible done on me, and they found nothing wrong. I just kept getting sick because I had worried myself to sickness over my sin. The funny thing is that, to the world, I was a saint. The Baptist-run school gave out citizenship awards each year to the most well-behaved students. I always won one of those awards. However, in the fifth grade, I did not get one. Instead, they decided that, because I always did my homework, got good grades, obeyed the teacher, and did not misbehave among the other kids, I deserved a special award. They created the Christian Maturity Award just for me. I was the only student ever to receive it. And, yet, I could not sleep much at night, I was always scared of sinning and having a devil possess me and then going to hell when I die, and I was very sick and skinny for many years. I had about 4% body fat and had dangerously low potassium levels due to the vomiting. To top it all off, I was also scared that I had committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost for which there is no forgiveness, Matthew 12 verses 31 to 32. The church taught that this is the unpardonable sin. They interpreted the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost as mocking someone who is speaking in tongues or moving in the Spirit. In other words, it is mocking what the Holy Ghost was doing in a person in a church service. Because of this, I never would make fun of or mock those things. However, I hated it when someone spoke in tongues during prayer time after the sermon because it meant that I would be sitting quietly in the pew for another 30 to 60 minutes, and I wanted to go home. Since sin comes from the heart, perhaps, during just one of those times, I had mocked the Holy Ghost in my mind for a few seconds. Perhaps that is why I did not get sanctified, because I had lost my salvation and could never regain it because I had committed the unpardonable sin. So, no matter how hard I tried, I would still end up in hell. All I had then was a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, Hebrews 10 verse 27. I should note that things got better for me once I started the 8th grade. While I was still very skinny, in my second year of college, I had a body fat analysis done, and I only had 4% body fat. Such a low percentage is usually only found among bodybuilders who intentionally do things to get that skinny in order to show off their muscles. While I did lift weights, I also drank weight-gaining shakes, ate pure pasta, and ate cans of tuna fish, and I still couldn't gain weight. I was 5 feet 7 inches and 119 pounds, I stopped getting sick and throwing up every week. 
That is because I was homeschooled from 8th to 12th grades. During that time, I stayed by myself, having no interactions with other kids, except at church. I also could not wait to graduate from high school so that I could live in a world of adults, thinking that would be a lot better. Ha! Huh. Therefore, I did all of my work as fast as I could and ended up passing the high school proficiency exam, which is the equivalent of getting a high school diploma, when I was 15 years old. I started college when I was 16. Because I was so mistreated by kids, I have always hated being around kids, even when I was one, and have never wanted to have kids of my own, even to this day. Learning the truth. When I was about 17 or 18 years old, my uncle took his Sunday school teacher's challenge to read the Bible through in a year. When he got to Romans, he had a Martin Luther-like transformation. Romans 3 verse 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. This verse makes it clear that our works are not necessary to maintain our salvation. Romans 5 verse 9 says, Much more than, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans 5 verse 11 says, We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. If we have justification and atonement now, it stands to reason that we cannot lose our salvation. Therefore, Romans teaches salvation by faith alone, and it teaches that you cannot do anything to keep it or lose it. My uncle knew that I studied my Bible a lot, and so he asked me if I agreed with those conclusions. I told him that those verses appear to be saying that. He said he would find a church that taught these things. He started attending a non-denominational church. One of the men from that church came over to his house and taught these truths to three generations my grandmother, my uncle, and myself. My grandmother did not have a biblical argument to use against him but she refused to believe what he was teaching. I knew that salvation by faith alone and eternal security were very much opposed to what I had been taught. However, there was no denying that the Bible said these things. Because my church taught that salvation was kept by continuing not to sin, I did not remember ever hearing these eternal security verses that the man brought up to us. However, I knew plenty of verses that taught that you could lose your salvation. Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Revelation 2 verse 5 says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. In fact, in the Baptist-run school that I attended through seventh grade, I once debated against a fellow classmate, taking the stance that you can lose your salvation. I brought up Revelation 2 verse 5 as proof that you could lose your salvation. The teacher said, well, the verse does not say you lose your salvation. It says your candlestick is removed out of its place. That could mean anything. That answer taught me nothing, except it made me more confident that I was right. Therefore, when the Bible teacher from my uncle's new church brought up his salvation by faith alone and eternal security verses, I was not going to believe them, unless he had an answer for my verses which say that you can lose your salvation. Surprisingly, he did have an answer, right division. He explained that, in order to understand the Bible, we must rightly divide the word of truth, as we are commanded to do in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15. In other words, although the whole Bible is for our learning, 2 Timothy 3 verses 16 to 17, only a small portion of it is actually written to us for us to follow today. This is contrary to what every Christian church denomination teaches, but it makes perfect sense in light of scripture. First, we know that God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2. Therefore, all of God's word is true, John 17 verse 17. Second, we know that God has promised to preserve his word forever without error, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7, Matthew 24 verse 35, even down to the very letters, Matthew 5 verse 18. 
Therefore, the Bible, that I hold in my hands, is God's inspired, perfectly preserved word, and it is true. This means that we cannot change a single verse, a single sentence, a single word, or a single letter of God's word. It is 100% accurate without error as it stands. With this in mind, let's look at what the Bible says about the most important question that it answers, how do I receive eternal life? Genesis 6 verses 13 to 14 says that salvation comes by building an ark. Genesis 15 verses 5 to 6 says that eternal life comes by believing that God will make your seed as the stars in heaven. Acts 2 verse 38 says that remission of sins comes by repenting and being water baptized. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 says that the gospel is to trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin. Since we know that there are no errors in those verses, we know that all of them are true as they stand. Since they all give different methods for salvation, we must conclude that God spoke those salvation messages to different audiences, such that each message is true only to its intended audience. Thus, we must rightly divide among the salvation messages to determine which message was spoken to whom. Building an ark was a salvation message to Noah only. Believing his seed would be as the stars in heaven was a salvation message to Abraham only. Repenting and being water baptized was a salvation message to Israel only. Trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin is the salvation message for us today. Thus, we should believe all salvation messages are true, but we should not believe they are all applicable to us today. If you do not rightly divide, you will never see this. The man from my uncle's new church taught me how to rightly divide. He showed me that the only part of the Bible written directly to us today is Paul's epistles Romans through Philemon. This is because Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, to whom the mystery was revealed, Ephesians 3 verses 3 to 5. This mystery was kept secret from the beginning of the world, Romans 16 verses 25 to 26, until revealed to Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 10 to 11. Since God is saving the Gentiles right now, Romans 11 verse 25, this is the message that is applicable to us. Therefore, those passages in Romans that talk about eternal security, Romans 5 verses 9 and 11, are true to us today. In fact, God would have to damn the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal hell in order to send me there, 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, and God's justice precludes him from doing that, Psalm 9 verses 7 to 8. Meanwhile, passages, like Matthew 10 verses 22 and 33, Hebrews 6 verses 4 to 6, 10 colon 26 dash 29, 12 colon 25 dash 29, 2 Peter 2 verses 20 to 21, and Revelation 2 verse 5, are all applicable to Israel before the mystery was revealed to Paul and after the rapture of the body of Christ. I finally had an explanation of how passages about losing your salvation and about eternal security can both be true. In other words, my salvation today is eternally secure, while Israel, in their program, can lose their salvation. That is not to say that Jews today can lose their salvation, since God treats both Jews and Gentiles the same today. See Romans 2 verses 6 to 12 and Ephesians 2 verse 14. However, at the same time, this right division explanation just did not seem right. After all, if it is true, then why doesn't any Christian church denomination believe it? The answer is that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, Proverbs 25 verse 2, because he is only a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, Hebrews 11 verse 6. In other words, only true Bible believers will ever discover and believe right division. Those who casually attend church and believe what churchianity tells them will not discover the truth. On the other hand, I had been attending an established church denomination, which had made me a complete mess mentally. So, believing something that a lot of people believe is not necessarily a good thing. At the same time, I did not want to go from one cult to another cult. Therefore, I decided that I would believe right division, as long as the Bible supports it. That was about 25 years ago, and I still have not found one error in right division. 
Rather, it is the only explanation that lets God be true and every man a liar. Romans 3 verse 4. Easy believism. Words cannot even begin to explain what a relief it was that I no longer had to worry about what I did in order to maintain my salvation. Although it took some time to get out of the mindset of saying, Lord, please forgive me for that bad thought I just had and save me again, I had stopped getting sick and I could now sleep through the night. As far as churchianity is concerned, I had gone from one extreme to the other. I soon found out that the belief of eternal security is seen by most church denominations as being easy believism. In other words, they see it as an excuse to sin rather than as being the truth of God's word for today. It turns out that no Christian church denomination believes in eternal security. Granted, the Baptists say that they believe in eternal security, but they really do not believe it. For example, if I became a member of their church, was there every Sunday, had a godly lifestyle, and then murdered someone, they would say that I was never saved in the first place, because I never had saving faith or true faith. Therefore, although Baptists claim to believe in eternal security, they really do not, because they would condemn to hell anyone who does not meet their standard of living. However, eternal security means that there is nothing I can do to lose my salvation, Therefore, even a mass murderer and child molester, if he has trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin, has the gift of eternal life, even if he continues to live as he did before he believed. That is why Paul told the Corinthians four times in the same letter that all things were lawful for him to do, 1 Corinthians 6 12, 10 23. The objection is, but, God did not save him to continue in sin. Yes, that is correct but it still does not mean that he loses his salvation if he sins. So, what should we do after we are saved? Sadly, no Christian church denomination today has the correct answer for this. That is okay, because God has given us the answer in his word. We need to make the Bible our final authority, or else we can get mixed up in many ungodly things that are cloaked in godliness, 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, as the church that I grew up in did. In order to understand what we need to do, we need to have correct thinking. In order to understand your mind, we need to start at the beginning with Adam, 